Um, and with that, uh, um, I'm pleased to include uh, in our conference Raj Samani, uh, Chief Scientist and Fellow of McAfee and Special Advisor to the Cybersecurity Center uh, in Europe. Um, Raj, uh, over to you and uh, introduce yourself and uh, you know why, why you are joining the uh, conference. Uh, how did you maybe get into cybersecurity as well? And uh, what's your topic? Thank, thank you, Vlad. Um, so actually, I've been with the CSA for a, a fair while now. Um, I was the co-author for the CSA Guide to Cloud Computing with Jim Revis and Brian Honan. Uh, great read. Um, and actually, I think a lot of the kind of contents of that book are still applicable today. But what I wanted to do today was really provide a different purview of the threatscape and, and specifically talk about the cloud native adversary. It, the, the reality is, is if we look at the way that, you know, certainly major attacks have been occurring over the last maybe three years, we've seen a level of capability that actually from a pure technical perspective is to be lauded. I mean, when we think about something like Gancrab, for example, this crew claimed to have made $2 billion. And yes, okay, a lot of that money went into buying Lamborghinis. Um, there was one in particular where we saw a ransomware affiliate have a camouflaged Lamborghini and then post it on Instagram. So there is definitely those that are spending money on, on cars and, and you know, houses and so forth. But actually, there is a lot of investment going into, into reinvestment into malicious tools that are targeting organizations across the world. So what I want to do today is really provide an insight into the cloud native adversary, because whether we like it or not, adversaries are improving and they are getting better. And of course, that allows them to be able to generate more revenue. If you remember with things like Tesla Crypt, you know, early ransomware examples where the amount of money being charged was a couple of hundred bucks. Now the average ransomware demand is in six figures, but actually there are those cases in which they're, you know, seven figure sort of sums that are being demanded and even eight figure sums that are being demanded. And a lot of that's really because the adversaries are able to find new ways to choke out companies and demand more. So I'm going to try and share my screen. And I, I think I've cleaned my screen, so there shouldn't be anything um, that I don't want to share. OK, so that should be sharing now. Um, Vlad, scream if it's not working, please. It is definitely <laughs> visible and uh, it looks great. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks a lot. So I don't really want want to stay on PowerPoint too long. Actually, I'd like to get into a discussion if possible, because I mean, that really, that really is where we're going to kind of get the best content. But let's just try and frame the discussion. Like, what do we mean by the cloud native adversary? You know, is there is there more than just one cloud native, cloud native adversary? Well, actually, there is. But perhaps to just kick this discussion off, you know, this was a great talk from um, uh, a great quote from Gartner which is 95% of cloud security failures will be the customer's fault. And of course, for us as a security industry, and those of you that are on Twitter, and by the way, if you're on Twitter, I would strongly encourage you to follow Lee. Um, Lee and I go back a number of years, and uh, he's one of the smartest people I know. Um, but if we think about, you know, specifically who we blame for most incidents, for us as an industry, there is a common there is a common exercise to kind of go, well, yeah, that could have been stopped, but you know, the customer didn't do something. Or this particular ransomware attack could have been stopped, but the customer didn't stop something. And sometimes, yeah, and, and yes, there's an element of truth to that. Let, let's be let's be blunt, but we've got to understand and acknowledge the fact that actually managing a security environment today is difficult. I mean, I used to be a CISO and um, I'll be honest, the thought of ever going back to becoming a CISO does fill me with dread sometimes because the reality is, is that what we've got to protect is so much bigger and broader than anything that we've ever kind of witnessed before. I mean, I remember when I started in this industry and cybersecurity was just simply making sure that the modems on every desk were switched off at night. You know, <laughs> you know, we used to have PC Anywhere on every single device and we used to just say, hey, look, just switch off the modems and we're secure. 
And it's slightly more difficult than that. And, you know, I think when we think about one of the reasons that we see that is in part because we've got, just got so many more assets that we need to protect. I mean, where we put our data now, it can be in one, two, three, multiple locations, literally all at the same time. And I had a really long debate. One can call it an argument. Those of you that have ever spent an evening with Daniela um, from the CSA actually will know, I made the case that availability is the enemy of security. And he was like, well, that's not true. But actually, if you think about it, you know, if we want to try to create systems that are confidential, data that is confidential, if we have it in one place, it's a lot easier to protect. But likewise, there is an impact on availability. And, you know, the cloud to me is one of those such technologies that it, by its very nature makes protection slightly more difficult and certainly confidentiality more difficult. And to test that out, we decided to run an internal exercise. And we kind of said, well, OK, well, we know that one of the treacherous 12 or the notorious nine, those of you that have like with the CSA failure, like not for a long time, I strongly encourage you to look at some of the past papers. But one of the things that that we talked about within the CSA was the the accessibility of credentials that can be used for malicious purposes. And of course, that's understandable. If you think about something like Colonial Pipeline, of course, or pretty much every other major breach you've read about, invariably it begins with the access of credentials. I think it was a Verizon data breach report that said something like 80 plus of all, 80 plus, 80 plus percent of all breaches were as a result of, of, of credential theft. And of course, that theft doesn't have to be somebody coming in and using Mimi cats to steal creds. Actually, in some cases, that can be just simply poor management. And so we decided to test this theory out. And we said, well, let's do a GitHub search for AWS access IDs. In other words, let's have a look at which companies or which organizations are using GitHub and embedding credentials inside their GitHub repos. And you'd have said, well, come on, that's ridiculous. I mean, you know, it's not like a you. Like, <laughs> I remember when I used to do so um, pen testing, physical pen testing, and in some cases it was simple as just going down and looking at post-it notes on on people's monitors. But in this particular instance, it was a case of these are developers. Let's have a look at what developers are doing, and let's have a look at the mistakes that they're making. It's something as simple as you know embedding credentials within GitHub, GitHub repos. And the number was staggering. Like, to be honest, the number was 384,000 results. And by the way, this was a couple of years back. So I, if you had to ask me what the likelihood is, my guess is it's probably going to be higher. But th there is an absolute element of truth to the fact that you know, the security departments and the security teams in the past, where you just have to look after in assets inside your network, now actually you've got to start looking at repositories on GitHub, even things such as, you know, are our executives communicating with threat actors on, on like portals like LinkedIn? But of course, that's made and complicated the environment a lot harder. And of course, yes, it is the customer's fault, but likewise, it's not the security department's responsibility, or it is now perhaps to start looking at repositories like GitHub. So if we start to think about, well, where are we today? I mean, you know, in, in view of the landscape with regards to organizations across the world. Oh, on, okay, great. If we start to think about, well, okay, how does that translate to, to today's attacks? And of course, we just touched upon, you know, like the, 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 the CP attack, or we can look at things like HSE. I mean, there is no doubt that we're seeing these types of, oh, gosh, I just realized I put my BBC username on there. That's, that's, a, that's a mistake. Um, but if we start to think about these types of attacks, how are they basically getting in and where is the cloud component to all of this? I mean, the reality, and as I mentioned earlier, is we know that threat actors are getting better, or at least it looks like it from the headlines. You know, the headlines would lead us to believe the fact that actually they're able to demand more money and they're able to compromise more organizations. So if we look at specifically DarkSight, and DarkSight, as you know, are one of the ransomware groups, the one predominantly behind the, the colonial pipeline attack. And by the way, um, there has been a story which claimed that it was Revel. Um, I, I believe that particular story was a mistake. As far as we're aware, it was certainly Darkseid. But 
in the past, protecting an environment just meant installing a, a, a you know an antivirus product. But if we look at the way that threat actors are actively evolving today, that's not the case. I mean, what they're leveraging and utilizing are tools within an environment that quite frankly should and are probably quite likely being used for, for, for legitimate purposes. Tools like real VNC, tools like RDP, tools like um, uh, you know, AnyDesk and TeamViewer. And the reality is, is that by the time malware starts to be deployed within an environment, it's really at the final stage. And by that time, Active Directory has been compromised. By that time, we've got multiple persistence mechanisms inside the environment. But what's relatively new, and you might notice on the right-hand side, is the use of R-Clone. Now, tools like R-Clone, I would anticipate, are probably being legitimately used. Of course, R-Clone by itself is a tool that's used to allow organizations the ability to be able to back up and encrypt files to cloud storage. And it has integration with you know, multiple different cloud, cloud storage vendors. I'm sure many of you have probably looked at it or are probably even using it inside your environment. But what we start to witness and what we start to see are threat actors leveraging and utilizing affiliates. Affiliates themselves are, um, it's almost like a franchise model, I guess you could call it. The franchise model allows ransomware developers to let utilize and use um, individuals that have network pen testing skills those pen testing skills are then used to compromise an environment, but also more importantly, do things such as exfil data. And by exfilling data outside of an environment, it really allows them to demand higher payments and higher demands. I'll give you a case in point. So I had a call from the CEO of a large supermarket. In fact, Vlad knows them very well. And um, I, I got this call. Actually, I got a call from my cousin. And he says, look, my friend's just been compromised. He's the CEO of this large conglomerate that run food. And they've been comprom compromised by Darkseid. And when I got on the phone to him, he said to me, Raj, he said, um, you know, is there a decryptor? And I said, well, actually, there is a decryptor for Darkseid, but the variant you've been hit by is that there, there is no working decryptor for. So I said, look, unfortunately, you're going to have to basically either pay and I wouldn't recommend that, or you need to rebuild your environment. And he says, you know, for us, rebuilding the environment's not a problem. You know, we can rebuild an environment, and we, we, we've got backups and we've got access to our data. But for us, what the biggest concern is going to be is the fact that data has been stolen. And the fact that they're going to leak that information, it's going to be hugely impactful to our reputation and also my reputation to my partners and my stakeholders and my customers. And it's these cloud native adversaries that are exfilling data in a really lightning speed fashion that have the ability to be able to really choke hold companies that maybe, you know, availability isn't the key issue for them. Maybe it is things like confidentiality. In fact, the interesting part about Darkseid was the version three variant, which actually didn't see the light of day under Darkseid, was able to encrypt a, I think it was a 10 gigabyte server within 8.6 seconds. So this is some of the challenges that I think we're going to witness and we're going to see. And of course, for you as, a, as, a, as an organization, the problem isn't going to be, well, can I detect you know, the use of our clone or the use of TeamViewer or the use of VNC? The problem is going to be the 150,000 events that our SOC receives a day. Can I find the three of them that is malicious? And that's why we're seeing, I, I would argue, like the growth of, products like EDR, but also MDR, where the, the, the noise can be filtered out and really identifying the difference between malicious usage and non-malicious usage. And of course, to stress, this is not a only a criminal perspective. I gave a talk yesterday at Web Summit, and um, I talked about the dual use of tools that are being leveraged by not only the criminal gangs, but also nation state groups as well. So the same modus operandi and in many cases, the same tools are being used by threat actors of varying different intent. And that's gonna be the challenge I think we're gonna we're going to begin to see and we're gonna witness. And of course, this is an example of some of the cloud service vendors that things like our clone will actively support. So, you know, if you are using 
I don't know, any one of these. Let's say, for example, you're using an you know S3 or you're using you know Google Drive or cloud storage, for example, you're gonna see, and you may not even have those alerts, but you're you're gonna see that type of interaction and that type of communication all of the time. The question is, is can you identify the one that's malicious? If you remember <clears throat> a couple of years back, uh, Kaspersky published a report into Carbonac, and Carbonac was an attack against the financial services industry. And I, I, from, 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 I believe from that particular report, one of the impacted organizations was seeing communications going to um, a country in Southeast Asia, right? I mean, <laughs> I'm not going to tell you which it is, but I'm sure you pretty much can guess. But they had a country in Southeast Asia, and they said, well, hang on. Why are we seeing communications going to Southeast Asia? And that then kicked off an IR incident, which then led to the identification of the Carbonac Group, which then allowed Kaspersky to publish the report, and that came up with a potential billion dollar loss to that industry. Now, it's not that easy anymore. You can't just look at it and go, well, hang on, we've got no communications going out to like, you know, North Korea, for example. So we need to, we've clearly got an issue going on. The, these, these, this, this interaction or these communications or this, this data flow, this data exfil will look just like any other data record, not even data exfil, but any other communication that you will see normally. The challenge is going to be how can you differentiate between what is legitimate and what is not legitimate. And of course, threat actors are leveraging and utilizing that. The fact that actually we've got these, these you know, millions and millions of events coming into an environment, hiding this in kind of plain sight is going to be some of the biggest challenges that we can see. And of course, as I touched on earlier, this entire mechanism is, is, is facilitated by what I would argue is, you know, a criminal landscape that is, that is organized, that is, um, that allow different partners with different skills, the ability to be able to communicate and work together. You know, whereas historically you would have a, a ransomware operator and a victim, and there was almost a one-to-one -one relationship, you've now got these middle men and women and these groups who have pen testing skills. These have network, you know, uh, ne pen testing skills. But you know what I mean? Like, they're not just people that are creating phishing emails and sending them out. They are actively compromising organizations, undertaking lateral movement, um, compromising AD, identifying the systems that are important and then exfilling data using common cloud service models. That is very, very difficult to protect against. Of course, it's very difficult to protect against when you're not leveraging things such as like in, 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 in the ICS space, I would anticipate organizations to use things like, like um, network whitelisting, for example, but in a common IT environment, that's next to impossible. So most networks are very noisy. And of course, affiliates are leveraging and utilizing this. And, you know, to stress, I, I kind of said the most um, overused term in our industry is sophisticated. You know, you'll see when major breaches occur, companies will turn around and say, well, it was a sophisticated attack. There's nothing we could have done. Well, look, that, that word sophisticated is nonsense. It is noisy. The threat actors aren't quiet. They're barely ever using zero days. I mean, this is not like an NSO kind of vulnerability. This is not an iOS O-Day. This is, you know, using a password like welcome and, and using Mimikat, like using tools that your pen testing team probably use. But the reality is, is that they're able to do so because the environment's noisy. And of course, they're skilled with regards to these types of attacks. And here's an example as well. They're constantly investing and they're constantly putting more development into their tools and actually what's remarkable is the the operators of these campaigns are, are undertaking technical assessments to determine the capability of affiliates that allows them to basically go out and compromise and of course they're constantly putting development into these new tools and so you're dealing with an adversary that is improving all of the time in this case this was i think this was the dark side crew yeah the dark side crew and they were carrying out development 12 hours a day, five days a week, and they've got a well and a large and well-coordinated team. Now, of course, some of that's probably wishful thinking and boasting, but the reality is, is that that is what you are dealing with, and that is what all of us are kind of having to deal with. And of course, the net result of all of this is 
not only is data being encrypted, not only are demands going higher, but also data is being published and data is being leaked. And for many organizations, it's not the encryption of data, it's the leaking of information as we kind of touched upon earlier. So if you're an organization where availability may not be the, the, the most important thing, whereas it's confidentiality, that allows them to demand more money. And I have to stress, if you're not having conversations with your CEOs, with the board today about you know, your ransomware preparedness pr plan on what you're going to do, are you going to pay? You haven't verified and reviewed the small print in your insurance policies, your cyber insurance policies. You need to start to do this now because I can assure you, actually, I'm not going to say that. I'm not going to say that. I know other people have said, yeah, what, is it, what, is this, what is it they said? They said, it's not a question of if you're going to be hacked. It's a bad question of when. I, I don't like that. So let's just pretend I didn't say that at all. But it is better to be prepared and it is better to anticipate. And it is better to understand the, the modus operandi of the increasing capability of affiliates and threat actors across multiple different you know, categories, whether it's nation state, whether it's organized crime um, as well. So, of course, in amongst all of this, why did that come up? Why did my title not come up? There we go. Okay, in amongst all of this, you know, you're not only dealing with the more capable threat groups, you're also dealing with, let's call it the less capable threat groups, the noise. But let me let me stress, the, you know, the, the precursor to all of these types of attacks is either, you know, the, the, the acquisition of credentials or even the phishing emails. And in amongst all of this kind of increased capability, you still have to deal with the, let's call it the less capable threat actors out there. And they're doing everything they can to gather credentials from your users. And so, we, you know, this is kind of like a perfect storm of, you know, like high volume attacks such as these to more capable threat groups, to nation state threat groups. And all of this is being done in an automated fashion. And actually, ironically, and perhaps more concerning, is they're not just using email. For example, we identified a, a threat campaign leveraging and utilizing LinkedIn. And so they're coming in over different channels. They're coming in. I think there was a there was a, a hacktivist group that were using direct messaging in Twitter. I mean, these types of channels that they're leveraging and utilizing, in many cases, are outside of the purview of the SOC. You know, like I know my SOC doesn't have access to my LinkedIn account, thankfully. Um, but likewise, the threat is still relevant because I'm using my same device and my same platform. So the enemy of security is complexity. Well, maybe not complexity, because let's be honest. Well, is it complex? I, you know, I, I, I remember, I think it was the first CSA paper. I think Paul Simmons, I think Paul Simmons was the author for this. Um, and he talked about the migration to cloud begins with understanding the governance within a specific environment. Realistically, those of you, many of you know the dependencies and independent and sorry, the dependencies that applications and systems have is getting harder and more complex each and every single day. And so as you begin to do your cloud migrations, that's some of the challenges that you face. And of course, threat actors are depending upon this as a vehicle to try to exfiltrate or infiltrate various different environments and exfiltrate data. That's some of the challenges that we face. And of course, if you can't, if you can't find a way for a SOC to identify the actionable intelligence alerts on a daily and a regular basis, then unfortunately, that's what the threat actors are depending upon. I'm up against time, so I wanted to thank you all. Um, again, the obligatory Twitter handle is on the bottom right-hand corner. Feel free to connect if you wish. But I wanted to thank you all. Look, this is not a vehicle for me to try and push products. This is more to kind of demonstrate exactly what we're witnessing within the threat scape today. The bad guys and girls are getting better. And unfortunately, that does mean that, you know, major systems and major organizations are being compromised at will, it seems. But if we understand the way that the threat actors are working, it can provide us the best tactics in order to be able to prevent or at least reduce the, the, the risk of you being next. With that, thank you very much. I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. Raj, that was great. Uh, we've got a few questions. One cheeky question from Lee. Uh, so, you know, <laughs> prepare yourself. So, 
Lee is asking, uh, you know, how are the cyber attackers using AI? Obviously, we know that, um, you know, cyber vendors, you know, like, you know, make a fee as well. And others, you know, uh, push the AI and machine learning in their, at these marketing materials as well. And obviously, the technology is evolving uh, quite a lot. But have you seen evidence of the cyber attackers using the similar technologies uh, in their attacks? I no, I'd, I'd say it's a little early to start seeing kind of wide scale use of AI. I mean, look, why would you sit down and develop an AI model to be able to identify specific threat actors when you can go to a dark web forum and buy an RDP password for three bucks? Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. like, like, like really, why would you kind of go through that effort? Now, there are some examples. I think Tom Brewster published a piece in Forbes in which um, some of the uh, BEC fraud scammers were leveraging and utilizing uh, like a deep fake voice to to sound like the CEO in order to be able to convince somebody to transfer money. So I'd say it's beginning, um, but but in fairness, I, I mean, it's not very difficult to go out and gather credentials and then use RDP to gain access to an environment. So why on earth would you invest in something like like you know like like a new a you know like a new ml model because it's that simple but that that being said you know it is something that we're actively considering and working and i don't know if you saw the research we did on tesla or the research we did on you know tsa face scanners and facial recognition scanners it there there are vulnerabilities that in modern ai systems you to use to protect us so whether it's driving cars or whether it's going through security there are vulnerabilities with that. So they, they will likely be exploited and they probably may even be exploited today. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks. Um, you know, perhaps just looking a little bit into the future, and we've got a few minutes, um, you know, where do you see, you know, cybersecurity attackers and defenders, let's say in, you know, two, three years time, you know, what what's beyond the horizon? You know, everybody's talking about predictions for 2022, which is, you know, just, a, you know, short while, few months, but uh, what about slightly longer? What do you, what do you think? Well, I think we'll all have gray hair by then, or we'll all be shaving our heads this short <laughs> to hide the gray hair. Like I do, yeah. Yeah, well, I, you know, I did the same, actually. I was on a video and I saw, I said, blimey, I look really old, so I'll just have to take it, I'll have to take a serious cut to it. Um, where do I think the future is going to be? I mean, look, it is becoming really very political. And we are going to, like, one of the things that has to change, and, and, and maybe this is less of a prediction and more of a wish, is we've got to make it easier to, for us to be able to protect and go after threat actors. You know, today, th something like, um, uh, like who is, for example, Right in 2017 or 2018, um, EC3 wrote about in the IOCTA, which is the Internet Organized Crime Threat Assessment Report. You've now got to issue an MLAT, which is a Mutual Legal Assistance Treaty, to gather registration details for for a domain. Now, th that is the most ridiculous thing on the planet because who is literally is the first thing that we look at when we are investigating a case, right? But if you've now got to wait two three weeks to get the registration data it's going to be harder. So I anticipate and I really, really hope, and it's one of the things that I'm lobbying hard for, is the security industry and security community need to band together and work harder and better as a community in order to be able to get the things that we need in order to do our jobs more effectively. I mean, the privacy industry have done that and something like GDPR is as a result of a community banding and working together. So one of the predictions that I have with, with both fingers crossed is we as a community will stop fighting with each other on Twitter and we'll start collaborating and working together. And I know the audience have gone on mute and they're probably laughing at really hard and saying, well, Raj, you're really naive, but it's more of a wish as opposed to a prediction. But again, if we wanted to make it a prediction, that's down to us. But you know, let's stop flaming each other for followers and let's start finding a way that we can actually get together and say, hey, look, GDPR is coming out, but can we at least make sure that something like who is isn't going to go dark for us? Or let's make sure that law enforcement don't have to do an MLAT in order to be able to get data. And even for us as an industry, as a security vendor, we need to make it easier for us to be able to protect our customers. And so for me, that's more of a hope rather than a prediction. 
Excellent. Excellent. Thanks, Raj. Uh, Raj. Uh, when, uh, where can audience find you if they want to get in touch with you? Well, at the moment, I'm in my wife's office, as you can tell by the pink wallpaper. But <laughs> yes. under normal circumstances, LinkedIn and Twitter is fine. Perfect. Thanks a lot, buddy. Uh, enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you. Love to the family. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.